For decades, scientific projects like SETI have been looking for evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations, but now we have learned that perhaps they've been looking for the wrong thing. Since the beginning, SETI has concluded, or at least some scientists at SETI have believed, that the most likely way that extraterrestrial civilizations would communicate with one another is utilizing the same technologies that we use, that is to say, narrow band radio transmissions. However, in February of this year, NASA received a laser message from a spacecraft in deep space, spanning 16 million kilometers. However, this signal did not originate from an extraterrestrial civilization or an alien spacecraft or anything along those lines, but a NASA spacecraft on its way to the asteroid belt called Psyche. Unlike traditional radio signals, this transmission came from advanced technology technology called the Deep Space Optical Communications Experiment, or DSOC, which utilizes near-infrared lasers to send data at speeds 10 to 100 times faster than conventional methods that NASA has used in the past. So, of course, it has occurred to SETI and organizations like them, indeed, it occurred to them quite some time ago, that alien civilizations might use a similar technology to transmit information as opposed to using outdated radio communications, and thus was born Optical SETI. And after an extensive survey of the sky, well, one of several, a particular survey has turned up something quite fascinating. A repeating signal, not from one star, but two. Signals that have completely defied all natural explanation and may finally be definitive evidence that we are not alone in the universe. Good afternoon, alien enthusiasts, and welcome to another Angry Alien Bulletin. For decades, the entire philosophy behind SETI's search for extraterrestrial intelligence, that is to say, when they have the money to invest in these sorts of searches, is to look for radio signals, narrow beam, powerful radio signals and that tend to only come from artificial sources, and also to look for those radio signals on specific frequencies that have to do with scientific principles that just about any intelligent species would understand. For example, radio frequency associated with hydrogen, the so-called hydrogen line. This, of course, is something that any intelligent civilization would understand because hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, or perhaps a frequency associated with the hydrogen line, say the hydrogen line frequency times pi, both of which, of course, would be concepts that any civilization would understand, or perhaps the square root of the hydrogen line. Something that should be understandable for just about any civilization that understands the basics of the universe and the basics of mathematics, but still, there's no guarantee that intelligent civilizations would use radio frequencies to communicate. I mean, sure, it makes a lot of sense to us to use these sorts of things, but is that the sort of medium that every civilization would make use of? Might there be other alternatives? Well, this is what a specific project uh, associated with SETI, known as Optical SETI, decided to pursue to look for potential laser communications throughout the cosmos. As a matter of fact, we humans are now using lasers to transfer information over vast distances. Our current probe that we have heading out to the asteroid belt has been testing this type of technology, and so far it's been working out very well. However, to be able to communicate information over enormous distances, light years and light years, you would need to have 
incredibly powerful lasers that can outshine suns. And not only that, these lasers would also have to be very specifically targeted. If you, say, wanted to send a communication from some sort of distant star, say 50 light years away to Earth, let's say that aliens decided that they wanted to try to communicate with us, well, they would have to be really precisely on target because it would take 50 years for the signal to get from their star to ours, and it would have to be a very narrow beam laser, meaning that they would have to account for the movement of our solar system, the movement of Earth in its orbit around the sun, etc. If you tried to use a laser with a wider beam that would have a larger area of detection, well, the amount of energy that would be required to power a beam that bright and that big would be just about impossible to accomplish. It would require more power than all of human civilization has combined to generate a laser that powerful. So really, when it comes down to it, Optical SETI has been looking for two things. Number one, a laser-like beam of light or just an extremely bright burst of light that can outshine a star but is a very brief thing. When things in nature, you very seldom get something that only lasts a few seconds in nature. Something that bright, supernova or a sudden brightening of a star. Those sorts of things last for days or weeks, not just a few seconds. But in addition to that, they also want the signal to repeat. That has been a frustrating requirement of SETI in order to confirm the artificial or intelligent origin of this sort of signal. It has to repeat. Well, guess what? Just recently, that is to say a few weeks ago, a paper came out from Optical SETI confirming that they had indeed found something just like that. The paper in question concerns the results of a multi-year survey of more than 1,300 sun-like stars for optical SETI signals, and veteran NASA scientist Richard A. Stanton was behind this project. Dr. Stanton is a veteran of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, whose work includes participating in the Voyager missions and serving as the engineering manager of the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, or GRAY mission. Since retiring, he has dedicated himself to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, utilizing the 76.2 centimeter telescope at the Shea Meadow Observatory in Big Bear, California, and a multi-channel photometer that he designed. The paper describing his survey's findings is linked in the description. For years, Stanton has used these instruments to observe more than 1,300 sun-like stars for optical SETI signals. And as I mentioned before, optical SETI looks for pulses of light that could result from laser communications or directed energy arrays, such as Project Starshot that will utilize an array of high-energy lasers to push probes, or laser sails that is, up to speeds approaching that of the speed of light. Now, this study traces its roots to a 1961 study by Dr. Schwartz and Towns, and they reasoned that the best way an extraterrestrial intelligence, or ETI, could send an optical signal that outshone their star would be with intense nanosecond laser pulses. Other optical SETI searches look for signals in infrared wavelengths, high-resolution spectra, or visible light. As Stanton related to Universe Today via email, his SETI search differs from conventional optical surveys. Quote, my approach is to stare at a single star for roughly one hour using photon counting to sample the star's light at what is considered to be a very high time resolution for astronomy, 100 microsecond samples. The resulting time series are then searched for pulses and optical tones. The instrument uses readily available off-the-shelf components that can be assembled into PC-based systems. After years of searching, Stanton noticed an unexpected signal on May the 14th, 2023, while observing star HD 89389, an F-type star slightly brighter and more massive than our sun, 
located in the constellation Ursa Major, otherwise known as the Big Dipper. According to Stanton's paper, this signal consisted of two fast, identical pulses 4.4 seconds apart that were not revealed in previous searches. He then ran comparisons against signals produced by airplanes, satellites, meteors, lighting, atmospheric scintillation, system noise, and other possible mundane explanations. As he explained several things about the pulses detected around HD 89389 made them unique from anything else seen previously. First of all, the star gets brighter and fainter and brighter and then returns to its ambient level, all in about 0.2 seconds. This variation is much too strong to be caused by random noise or atmospheric turbulence. How do you make a star over a million kilometers across partially disappear in a tenth of a second? The source of this variation can't be as far away as the star itself. Number two, in all three events, two essentially identical pulses are seen, separated by between 1.2 and 4.4 seconds. A third event, found in an observation on January 18th of this year, was not included in this paper, but it adds even more fascinating data to this study. But in over 1,500 hours of searching, no single pulse resembling these has ever been detected. Number three, the fine structure in the star's light between the peaks of the first pulse repeats almost exactly in the second pulse 4.4 seconds later. No one knows how to explain this behavior. And number four, nothing was detected moving near the star in simultaneous photography or in the background sensor that easily detects distant satellites moving close to a target star. Common signals from airplanes, satellites, meteors, birds, etc. are all completely different from these pulses. Now, of course, all of this is pretty interesting. An F-class star is bigger and hotter than our G-class star, but located about 100 light years away. So, sort of a promising area to look for an intelligent civilization, but not necessarily perfect. But Stanton decided that it would be a good idea to re-examine historical data for similar signals. And guess what? He found another pair of pulses detected around star HD 217014, which is also known as 51 Pegasi on September 30th, 2019. This is a much closer main sequence G-type star. This isn't just a similar star to ours, it's almost precisely the same, and it's located about 50.6 light years away. As I said, similar in size, mass, and age. In 1995, astronomers at the Observatoire de Haute-Provence detected an exoplanet orbiting this star, a hot gas giant that has since been named Dimidium. This is one of the first exoplanets ever detected and was the first time an exoplanet was discovered around a main sequence star. And of course, where there's one planet, there's probably more. And at the time, incredibly enough, the signal was dismissed as a false positive caused by birds. However, a detailed analysis ruled out this possibility completely for all of the pulses observed. Other possibilities that Stanton explored include Included refraction caused by Earth's atmosphere, possibly due to some kind of shock wave. However, this is highly unlikely since shock waves would have to occur with perfect timing to coincide with all three optical pulses, and three identical optical pulses, by the way, with three identical shock waves in the atmosphere, not very likely. Other possibilities include starlight diffraction by a distant body in the solar system, partial eclipse eclipses caused by Earth satellites or distant asteroids, and edge diffraction by a straight edge as described by the so-called Sommerfeld effect. 
and there's also the possibility that a gravity wave could have generated these pulses, although this is a phenomena that we don't really understand, but it still requires additional consideration. But of course, another interesting possibility, and it's amazing to hear mainstream scientists talk this way, is that it could be the result of extraterrestrial intelligence. As Stanton indicated, whatever modulated these stars' light must be relatively close to Earth, indicating that any ETI activity must be within our solar system. Moreover, similar pulses have since been observed from another sun-like star located 81 light-years from Earth, HD 12051, and January 18, 2025. To explain all three occurrences, Stanton stresses that more data is needed. Quote, none of these explanations are really satisfying at this point. We don't know what kind of object could produce these pulses or how far away it is. We don't know if the two pulse signal is produced by something passing between us and the star, or if it's generated by something that modulates the star's light without moving across the field. Until we learn more, we can't even say whether or not extraterrestrials are involved. But once again, I find it very, very interesting that they're talking this way at all. But after exploring many, many mundane explanations and coming up blank across the spectrum, the paper concludes thusly, quote, How are two nearly identical pulses generated separated by a relatively long interval of unaffected starlight? The fact that these pulses have been detected only in pairs must surely be a clue as to their origin. How can the two detected events, separated by years and from seemingly random directions in the sky, be so similar to each other? Whatever is found, those speculating that our best chance of finding evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence lies within our own solar system might have much to ponder. And when we're talking about our own solar system, what if these pulses coming from seemingly random directions in the universe are not coming from random locations at all? What if there's something about these signals that are specifically targeted towards us and further examination might reveal what they're actually trying to say and if they're expecting some sort of reply, not necessarily from us. Intriguing stuff, isn't it? But unfortunately, I have a feeling that like so many intriguing discoveries that have been made over the last several decades, the scientific community is just going to let this one go. They're not going to be able to find any sort of rational, logical, natural explanation for it. So they're not, of course, going to say that this seems to be a really good candidate for something that originates from an extraterrestrial civilization. Instead, they won't come to any solid conclusion. They'll simply say, oh, most probably it's some sort of natural phenomenon that we don't understand. And then they'll just move on to something else. Instead of dedicating the necessary time, the observation time, focusing on these relatively nearby stars for a long period of time to confirm whether or not these signals might reappear again and again. And interestingly enough, if we spot these sorts of signals happening repeatedly, what are they doing? Are they trying to get our attention or might they be communicating with somebody else within our solar system? Somebody that they dispatched decades ago to check us out, and now they're trying to get more information or issue instructions to their colleagues who are already here. By the way, folks, in case you haven't noticed, we've got a new shirt here, although this shirt has been around for a while. Check it out. It is our Amua Mua merch. I love this design, guys. It's absolutely fantastic and finally got it delivered to me personally. But unfortunately, the store closes on the 26th. And although there has been an increase in Amuamua sales lately, so I have a feeling that we probably will be able to offer it again next month. I can't say that for certain. So if you want to be sure that you get a piece of this merchandise, well, you have to place your order by the 26th of June. 
Also, I'm going to give away two of these shirts. I got two spare extra large shirts, and I'm going to give two of those at random to people who have been supporting my trip to Australia on GoFundMe. So if you've already made a contribution on GoFundMe, or if you'd like to make a contribution to get me to Australia, you will be entered into a drawing. And there haven't been tons. I mean, we're talking less than 60 right now. So your odds are pretty good if I'm giving away two of these shirts. All the details are in the description. Thanks very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, stay angry about space.